Chapter 01, an introduction. Historical future use log. Number assignment zero, zero, two. All right then, that's good enough. Hello there. My name is Vincent Monet Sansonanza, and I am a human. I work for an organization called the Constance Foundation. And if you're receiving this message, then it means you're probably not doing too well. I'm going to try to help you understand what's going on, but even so, a lot of it will fall onto you to understand by yourself. Keep in mind that what I am about to tell you will only grow to seem more real by the day, and only you will be capable of changing the fate of your world. To begin, the organization I work for can best be described as a Kasai Galactic Administration. But that, in all honesty, can easily be considered an understatement when you look at what they actually do on a day-to-day -day basis. Still, for the time being, I find it more useful to look at them like a private military that serves a specific purpose, and well, people like me, alongside 13 billion others, work for them on my home planet, Earth Prime. Now, I know, I know, I probably just lost you with all that, but just stick with me for a bit. Because honestly, that was the easy part. If it's any solace, I can promise you that you'll get to answer any questions you have yourself, given enough time. That's if you actually manage to stick around and understand what I say at all. Well, good luck with the language barrier, I guess. Ah. Anyway, I don't really have a way of knowing how technologically advanced your people are by this point, but given the fact you can see this message at all, I gotta assume you're ready for whatever comes next. Let's handle the hard part first. You'll get to see what I mean in just a bit. Just try your best to keep up. Imagine yourself waking up in the morning and setting up for breakfast. On the one hand, you have cereal, something easy and quick to make. But then, on the other hand, you have something a bit more complicated, like bacon and eggs. For example, they do take a bit of time, but hey, they might be worth it just for the extra boost, right? Now that choice, on a normal day, might not seem like such a big deal, right? Well, here's where things get a bit complicated. What if I told you that on this particular day, there's actually going to be an accident on your way to work? A car crash, if you know what that is? Grim, but nevertheless, today, someone is going to die. See where I'm going with all this. That simple choice now feels like it matters because now we have consequences. Some of you might already know this, but here's where the concept of timelines comes into effect. For example, let's say you chose to eat the cereal. Well, in that case, you end up seeing the crash happen as you go to work. Then, on the flip side, with the bacon and eggs, you end up getting stuck in traffic for hours. Now, both of those choices have their own consequences. In one, you get fired because you're late for work, while in the other, you see someone die. Of course, you might tell yourself something different, right? You don't really need breakfast, do you? Well, in that case, I can see how easily you end up being the one who crashes their car instead. You get the picture, right? See, I know this might seem like a cruel hypothetical, but regardless of the choices we make, big or small, they all have consequences. Among them is the fact that they create different timelines of possibilities, and every one of them is as legitimate as the other. On one, you died because you skipped breakfast. In another, you're so rich that you don't even drive a car anymore. Hell on most, I can guarantee you that you weren't even born to begin with. And we consider those to be the tiny differences. Now, there are literally infinite variables that would take me years to explain to you. I'm sure you're gonna have your own fun thinking about that for a while. But all in all, you just need to know one thing. The biggest difference between your timeline and mine is the Constance Foundation. To make it easy for you, I'll say it like this, in your world, the Foundation doesn't need to exist yet. Whereas in mine, they definitely do. They need to. But well, they are their own murky subject that's hard to get into. Nobody knows how long ago they were created. Let's just say there's conflicting information on that. But still, none of it actually matters. We might not know when or even how, but we definitely know why. It's actually easy to figure out once you think about it. Everyone knows why, because, frankly, it's too universal to even question it. It's why they are such a universal constant, an infallible truth of humanity, 
the natural conclusion of our success. The Constance Foundation has always and will always be born again. And even for you, it's only a matter of time more than anything. They are what we become, and that's, that's actually why I'm here, telling you about all of this. The longer it takes, the more likely it is that you will all die. <laughs> fucking hell. Ah, better to just fucking tell you. Not only are you not alone in the universe, but you are also currently surrounded in ways you never thought possible. Dangers that are far beyond your imagination. Things that come from other planets, other timelines, and dimensions that sit right in front of you. Even now, abominations from your own home in another time and in another place, but yet a single step away. And honestly, every single one is their own bucket of problems altogether. Still, out of all the fronts we fight against, the biggest and most problematic ones are against other timelines. Basically, some points in time change the core of existence altogether making things difficult. Fundamentals of the universe that change so far in the past or so far in the future that it buggles the mind to actually think about them. How to explain it best? Before the first star was born, there exist timelines where the universe itself was never created to begin with. Places where the very foundations of the universe got so twisted and fractured that chaos itself, to us, would look like perfection. Because of that, some of these places birthed monstrosities, while others created such unstable environments that given time, and just time alone, will begin to slowly corrupt other timelines like yours and mine. That alone is why the Constance Foundation exists. While many would paint them as some evil organization because of the lengths they go to, they still fight for all of us, for every living being. Of course, I can't tell you that I myself haven't been skeptical of them, but given everything I've seen and the people I've worked with, I can't even imagine it. I have seen them fight against truly impossible odds and fight against challenges that I believe God himself would absolutely tremble over. Yet through it all, I've seen them shine for the sake of others, fighting for both the known and the unknown, unlike anyone else in the universe. They dare to challenge the very concept of the impossible, not just for themselves, but for the sake of others, they carry that weight for all of us, for the sake of every single living thing in all existence. Hell, most aliens don't even pretend to care, let alone actually do anything for the benefit of anyone but themselves. But the Constance Foundation, no. The Constance Foundation isn't like that. They don't hold anything back if it means saving a few more. They simply fight, because trying is better than doing nothing at all, even against the impossible even against something they can't stop. Now, I realize this won't really make sense to you right now, but all of that ranting was just one of the categories. Haha, <laughs> I'm sure you can imagine the rest for yourself. That's definitely gonna take a while to sink in for you. You're welcome, by the way, or maybe I'm sorry about that I guess. Eh, hey, yeah, it only gets more complicated from here. We're barely getting started. But I'm sure that right about now, you must be asking yourself why. Why am I telling you of all people about this? Yeah, you specifically? Well, kinda I suppose. We need to talk about that sole individual watching this video, or document, I guess. But first things first, you should know something else too. See, all of this is actually a point of conflict within the Constance Foundation. The one thing I actually believe they do wrong. This might seem like a bit of a tangent, but I am sure you notice this document has a different marker from that of the Constance Foundation, right? Usually, they use CF in the top corner. Well, there's a reason this message is not from them. Because I am part of a group that's, in a way, I guess, kinda against the Constance Foundation, in a way. Not because they're actually evil or have done anything particularly bad, of course, but it's more about what they can't do, what they haven't done, what they aren't really willing or even be capable of doing right now at least. See, there's actually something else I haven't told you about yet. The fact that you're watching this or perhaps reading it means that regardless of where you are right now, your timeline, or more specifically, your leaders, have already been contacted by a number of organizations from other timelines. 
Obviously, that includes the Constance Foundation and the Die Well Collective. C. In an attempt to not only warn and teach you about the dangers that are now approaching your sector, both organizations tried to give you pretty much everything. All of humanity's collective knowledge across space and time, from every dimension we know of, to help you solve so many of the problems you have today. One tried diplomatically, while the other will eventually force the issue one day by killing every leader you have, because unfortunately, they have all refused. To explain the Die Well Collective, they are mostly an organization of former and current members of the Constance Foundation who disagree with the censorship of information on other timelines and dimensions, regardless of the will or the intentions of any political party. We act outside the political limitations of both the PCW and the Foundation for the benefit of civilizations that have unfortunately been enslaved by authoritarian powers, as well as provide information and resources to any independent systems that we deem suitable, providing them freedom from hunger and strife to the best of our ability. Unfortunately for you, our freely gifted offers have been rejected by the people you have allowed in power. They have not only taken from you a purpose, but they have robbed you of the peace and comfort every sentient being strives for. Something we gifted to you freely, but was nonetheless thrown away out of pride and gluttony. The technology that we possess far exceeds imagination and can solve so many of the problems you have today, not just in terms of medical aid or hunger, but in purpose, a purpose in helping others across time itself. Still, all of this has been ripped away from your generation as the next becomes predestined to die with a mere whimper. Though we will try to help when the time comes, you will likely die before that. Without the resources of the Constance Foundation, all we can really do for you now is give you dreams of our message. We know that all of this will be taken as nothing more than a story. Yet we believe, like many others, that it is far better for you to know a little than nothing at all. Truth be told, from our side of things, the only notable thing we can manage are visions given by a quantum AI computer to certain individuals in your world. This will slowly and very hopefully show you how to handle some situations, but it will still be hard for them to do so alone. So here is where I would like to ask you, and you specifically for a favor, something quite simple, but as large as a mountain. I understand perfectly that you will never fight for something you don't even believe is real, so instead, I only want you to do one thing, dream. I want you to dream so vastly, so deeply, that nothing short of action and ambition can possibly satisfy the deepest part of your soul or even your world. I want you to dream about a better today, to want a future in the here and now. I want you to rebel against everything you believe is impossible and at the very least, I want you to pretend to carry the weight of the world on your shoulders for the sake of others. I want you to hold these ideas in your heart and dream of a world where people lift burdens together. That is why this log exists for that sole idea, this one last hope, that one last spark in a person. I will never meet you, the icon of futures. And yeah, for that, I can easily give you everything I have. I'll share with you and just you alone my story and every single piece of information I can, if for no one else who listens from the very beginning. Chapter 02 Resolve I was born in a place called New London, west of Connecticut in the United States. Originally, my grandparents were from France, but they immigrated after World War II. As far as my parents go, well, I actually hate talking about them. It's needless to say that they were less than pleased to know what I actually dedicated my life to back then. After graduating from university and getting my doctorate in archaeology and social studies, I was branded a conspiracy theorist for believing in ancient aliens. Granted, granted I did enjoy the fact that I got to argue so much, but it definitely didn't win me any favors. Still, I remember back when I was a kid, I was watching some documentaries on UFOs over the White House, and obviously, being a retarded little kid, I was scared shitless. Heh, I remember crying alone in the corner of my room, watching as the TV cassette tape was paused, lighting the entire room. The brightness of the TV hitting my eyes. I was just a kid man, scared that some alien would take me. Just like all the stories said they would, I was alone in my room, with no one to hear me, no one to tell me I was okay. 
But then, on that day, I remember looking at the TV. The White House was glowing. Maybe it was the old TV or some trick of the cameras recording it. But it was just glowing so brightly, and those three white dots over it. They just shined so sharply, like tiny versions of the sun burning my eyes. In the end, I could have been there for hours just looking at it forever. But at some point, I asked myself, why? Who? And just like that, everything hit me like a fucking train. For whatever reason, that little retarded version of me came to the most insane conclusion of them all. A truth I didn't believe anyone other than me realized. For months, I had been watching so many documentaries, reading so many old magazines, and every single book by the fucking History Channel. Shit, I don't even know how I got them all, but I looked at everything I could find about the mysterious triangular craft popping up across the world. How they would only appear over military bases, about how they hovered over cities without a care, about the fact that ever since they showed up, no one had ever seen any other alien craft in the sky in years, and for a split second, I thought, it was ours. Those three dots, that massive ship in the sky, was man-fucking-made. Yeah, I kind of lost my shit at that point, like a little kid finding out his favorite superhero just won the fight on TV. One moment I was crying in the corner, then I was screaming and jumping for joy, slamming the play button on the old cassette tape. I swear the ship hovering over the White House now looked like it was part of some grand parade, like a declaration of victory broadcasted across the world, marching and everything. I guess that was a warning to all alien life forms. Humanity was ready for a fight in the dark. I guess given what I grew up on, it's rather easy to see how I was branded a conspiracy theorist, right? I wanted to be part of the fight, but I also wanted the truth to be out there. I didn't want to betray the message, you know, Still, to compare me to those freaks is pretty fucking insulting. I know most of those fuckers are just racist bastards too lazy to do anything, let alone actually make the truth come out. I honestly hate them with every fiber of my being. So yeah, I needed a way to stand out and get results, not just sit around doing jack shit and going insane. I started out by tracking UFOs and found out they have entire highways above us. It's actually not hard to see it for yourself. But yeah, I get it. Shitty pictures of dots aren't exactly proof, and buying an RPG wouldn't help me much either. Still, I remember that on one occasion I got so fed up that I actually ended up getting arrested for jumping inside a military base, a real dumb ass move I know. I ended up getting really fucking lucky with a judge, and of course I had my grade, a bullshit degree to help me out. But that said, I spent most of my time traveling the world looking for answers. Everything from the pyramids to ancient Indian cave systems. Of course, 90% of the time I got lost for weeks in pure darkness, or I had some problem with the local government. But I was never really afraid of going the extra mile, if it meant I actually got a tiny bit closer to a hint of truth. And after some time, I would come back to make full archaeological papers back home, just submit them by the hundreds to every university I could find back home. And well, that went exactly how you would expect it to. But I did at least get credited with some discoveries. Anyway, it was during one of these expeditions that things changed. I decided to return to the Sahara, just another simple goal, to explore the rings of Mauritania in the deserts of Africa, the location had an odd circular pattern of mountains. According to some people, the mountains reminded them of the high walls of the ancient lost empire of Atlantis, as said by the book of Plato himself. Looking at the satellite images, a type of technology we have to see things from space, it seemed beyond interesting to me. Granted, I wasn't delusional about it, probably some meteor crash site, but I decided to pack my bag for a long visit regardless. Unfortunately, on the way, I was left nearly 500 miles short of it, without a guide or even a car to get me there. At that point, I seriously needed to consider whether to turn back or not, but being so close to just turn around. Hmm. Hell. The fuck. No. I was going to get there one way or another. So fuck it. I'm walking there. It wasn't the first time that shit happened to me, so why would I give a fuck this time? This kind of problems are bound to happen every time, and I was, meh, somewhat prepared. 
with supplies at least. Honestly, I wasn't practically prepared exactly. As I mentioned, this trip was actually meant to be for setting up camp, to stay in one spot for months if need be, not to travel 500 miles on foot. But hey, I didn't survive in India just on luck motherfuckers. I'm not ever letting this go, even if it means I can only take a single fucking step an hour. I'm getting my goddamn ass over there motherfuckers. You can bet your ass on it. Deserts ain't got shit on me. And yeah, obviously, this was a very, very dumb idea. Still, I didn't really care. I moved on and struggled. A couple of things happened on the way. A pair of bags breaking, awkward standoffs against hyenas, nearly dying from heat twice, and even a native screaming at me in a language I couldn't understand. So yeah, not an easy trip, bro. And that's when I found it. A cave in the middle of an empty patch of dirt and sand. Even surrounded by endless dunes, I could see it for miles before I actually reached it. Feeling every step I took in that heat, I got closer to it. The pain in my feet was agony. I could feel my bags getting heavier as my socks melted into my feet. And yeah, maybe the heat was getting to me, but... I could feel that sensation creeping up on me as I managed to get inches away from the edge of what I now realized was actually a sinkhole. Yeah, the same feeling that boy had in the corner so long ago. Then again, in the literal heat of the moment, I barely recognized it. Inside, the stones looked recognizably man-made. Of course, everything looked collapsed, but the area was surprisingly open. Dropping down, I recognized it as a corridor that likely used to go on for miles in the direction I came in from, and although that side was now covered by rocks and sand, the other was simply dark, screaming at me to run. Throwing the rest of my bags into the hole, I blocked the feeling from my mind. I've done a metric ton of research on this area, and from what I've found, the location I'm in right now shouldn't even exist. I took some time to rest before setting up the camp and whatever this place was, it was big in more ways than one. But nevertheless, I noticed my hands were shaking. I was stalling for time out of fear. Then again, I could tell myself that fear and excitement were two sides of the same coin. The truth was that regardless of anything, this was the discovery of a lifetime. All but a few would ever get to see a place like this for the first time, and even less would get unrestricted access. If the world was ever going to see the inside of this place, it would be with only me right now. So I couldn't waste the opportunity because I didn't recognize how excited I was. Taking my camera and flashlight, I went ahead into the dark. It took me five hours to reach the end of the tunnel to a set of stairs, with none of the walls having even a scratch to them the entire way. As I walked ahead, the set of stairs led me to an opening. As I pointed my flashlight to the distance, I saw a village carved from the surrounding rock. I was amazed by the architecture and scale. Some of the buildings almost looked modern, and the height of the roof seemed impossible, but immediately my sixth sense kicked in as I became aware of the lack of life around me. The typical wear and tear of daily life in a village so large was nowhere to be seen. Wouldn't you expect there to be some signs? Simple things like ancient tools, dried up cloths, bones, trash, hell maybe even a chair. But no, nothing at all, not a bat, not a worm, just empty, carved out buildings, like a new city that no one had ever lived in. The sensation was unsettling to say the least, and the darkness combined with the repetitive empty architecture made me paranoid of my own shadow. As I peered deeper into the city's maze, I reached a more ruinous area, a place of half-made walls surrounded by piles of sandstone, my heart completely sank as the silhouette of a man popped out from around the corner. Crowned by detached wings, abominations surrounded the silhouette of a hooded man. The man in question pointed to the side, and although the hooded figure looked far too real, like a person that had been covered by a thin veil of clay, the only remaining clue saying otherwise was his face without a face. And although I doubt my memory is correct on this, the horrific depictions of beasts and severed wings that surrounded the man had to them a soft fluorescent glow of a dark end red to them. But in all honesty, I didn't bother to look, as the only thing I cared about was my curiosity, driven solely by fear. What the hell was the man pointing at? I really don't know why, 
but never did my eyes wonder about anything more than the darkness in front of my next steps. The air was too heavy as I began walking down the hall, and I felt as this fear impacted me at a consistent rate. For a while, I could have said that this fear was my own, yet having it course through me like this felt manufactured, like a change in pressure in the air. The waves of fear hit me each time like a truck. I don't believe you could understand what I actually felt in the moment, but it was like a constant gust of wind the fear of a car running by you mere inches away from wiping away your life. That feeling, that fear, assaulted my mind at a constant rate. It was something my body couldn't truly ignore. Yet somehow I gradually became more at ease with, I became more aware of its detachment from me each time. Watching my every step through the darkness, the noticeable circle of light from my flashlight suddenly cut in half. An unexplainable wall of darkness stood in front of me, and whatever doubts I had about my fears being my own disappeared in an instant. I waited irrationally for the wall of darkness to respond to my presence. Helplessly holding my breath, I stood my ground in a futile defiance, hoping to find an answer that could never possibly exist. Standing still, my hands in desperation needed to know that such a thing could never possibly exist. Traveling to all four walls in pure silence and desperation, my light never found a single gap within the endless void, like the boundless depth of the sky had been made to stand before me. Not by choice or by instinct did my hands move mindlessly, grabbing at that ethereal darkness. My fingertips hoped to reveal a veil, but only sparked a response of a thousand volts that illuminated my surroundings. The high-pitched sounds of crows echoing in the air persuaded my feet to mindlessly move forward deeper into that chilling sensation that enveloped my arm. Stepping past, water fell on me from all directions, and I was blinded by darkness for just a moment. Chapter 03 Beginnings in the Dark I can't really tell you in words what that moment did to me. But even so, today I tend to see it as something good. Of course, at the time, not only was my face a total mess, but I was also bleeding pretty badly from my nose. And I'm pretty sure that wasn't because of the wall of darkness. As soon as I stepped past the void, a wall of light hit my eyes like the sun itself, making me drop to my knees, paralyzed purely out of fear. Attempting to recover from such a mindless and irrational state of mind is something beyond what I can really say. But eventually I landed my shoulder on the wall next to me, trying desperately to remove my backpack so I could hide away my face from the blinding light. I couldn't stop shaking, so I smacked my head against the wall, breaking my own nose. The feeling of fear was now gone, and I could finally take in my surroundings. It was an odd sensation to suddenly see things so clearly. After taking a change of clothes out of my bag and eating some canned food, I decided to look around. The ancient stone corridor was still there, but it seemed to seamlessly morph into a brightly lit hallway with cement floors and metal railings. This area was clearly new, clean, and given the lights, it was frequently used. Something was telling me to go back, but honestly, I needed to know what just happened to me and what that void of darkness even was. After that short break, I noticed a symbol on the wall behind me that was not too different from that of the United Nations. Yet slightly different, instead of the world, the symbol showed a single continent, Pangaea Ultima. If I remember correctly, a depiction of prehistoric Earth, basically all the continents put together with a land mass at the bottom. In the center stood the number 33, and instead of the typical olive branches forming a circle, they seemed to be making part of a square. For me, deciphering the hidden message was easy enough. Not an ounce of trepidation. It was unlike anything I'd ever seen and definitely not made by the same people who created such cowardly standards. Glancing down the hallway, I was met with a door of bulkhead, but that's barely an accurate description. It appeared incredibly high-tech, almost like something you'd found in a vault. Next to it stood a flat plastic pad on the wall, probably for a key card. On top of it sat a distinct black dot, and I just hoped it wasn't for a tiny camera. 
I tried my best to turn the valve for the door, but unfortunately, that didn't seem to be humanly possible. Eventually, I tried ripping out the pad, but as my hand pressed against it, the door just suddenly began to open. Did I just break something? As the door opened, the cold air from the other side hit me. The darkening shine of the city reflected against my eyes, revealing an entire world hidden underground. I could see pillars of light shine as stars flew from one side to the other, while the glow of cars of all shapes and sizes seemed to move about randomly at the bottom of towers that pierced the solid rock above me with lightning. I've never seen a city shine with every color known to mankind. Even more unsettling is the fact that I've never seen such a large crowd of people on a single road from afar, yet it doesn't seem crowded or congested in any way. Having said that, as I followed the railings, I noticed that I couldn't have been higher than a floor or two above the ground, yet the railings seemed to go on past the horizon following the wall that arched towards the ceiling. And even though I'm reasonably fit on this occasion, I couldn't jump down because sharp rocks naturally covered the floor below. Following the railings, I looked out at the city and noticed that one of the drones in the distance seemed to stop and look at me, but it continued on. Still, I didn't need to risk it, so I quickened my pace. Further on, I saw a ladder with a safety cage. I got a bit closer, and the ladder seemed to go down to an underground area, so I walted the railing and climbed down the exterior of the cage. The floor, being too jaggered to properly stand, made me stumble all the way onto the highway, which seemed more intended for trucks than anything else. Unfortunately, as I began walking, a car blocked the main path. As the door swung open, a man in a strange black uniform said, Hey, it sure took you long enough, eh? I even got lost on the way here, and I still made it before you did. I looked around, trying to process what the man said, but I still wasn't sure he was even actually talking to me. Even though I was the only person there, obviously. That's right, I am speaking to you, Vincent. Yep, I know your name, dumbass. And I am also aware of your current address, so get over here. A friend of mine needs to talk with you. I considered running, but then four armed drones appeared from behind the trunk of the car. So let's just say I didn't find that to be in my best interest at the time. Soon as I got in, this guy started blasting the remix of Dancing by Aaron Smith in pure silence which definitely gave me a certain feel for the city, though. Something definitely felt off. The people I managed to see felt too normal. I mean, you know how most people just look trashy or too business-like? Well, people just look normal, but I don't know. Unique, like they weren't trying to show off, but still somehow carried their own styles. I don't know, they just felt real, I guess. And somehow, that felt wrong. Eventually, the man stopped in front of the large building in the center of the underground city, which appeared to penetrate the cave's roof. The building itself wasn't too far off from the Burj Khalifa, though maybe it was bulkier. As we entered, the interior appeared to be bustling with activity. I couldn't quite be sure about this, but it had to be pretty late in the night. Still, this place didn't seem to be slowing down, and the guy simply signaled at me to follow him. Alongside us, a smaller drone traded places with the other four. The tiny thing just looked at me and buzzed a taser, and I am pretty sure it was excited to get to use it. After navigating through a couple of hallways with strange guards wearing thin astronaut suits and hearing the snippety song of a drone buzzing a taser to the tune of wheels on the bus playing in the background, I heard the man say, All right, Vincent, you're going to be talking to I. He runs the joint, and he's going to fill you in on everything you need to know. He's going to ask you a couple of questions too, so stay on your toes. It's his choice what happens to you. So I recommend you to be cautious, all right? Ah, fuck, right? He's an AI, by the way, so good luck. After that, the guy left as he practically shoved me into an interrogation room, locking the door behind him. The drone seemed to still be listening to a song inside its head as it drifted from side to side silently. Suddenly, the red laser coming from the drone stopped, and it sat there frozen in mid-air as if defying the laws of gravity and time. The laser pointer then changed to a greenish-blue hue and began moving perpendicularly to plug itself into the wall. Well, hello there, Dr. Monet. It's a pleasure to meet you. Jesus fucking Christ, man. Yeah. Hi there. 
Where the hell did you come from? This wall? But perhaps we should leave this topic aside for another occasion, don't you think? Now, please, please sit down. You may call me Commander Oz, and you should know that I am quite a big fan of your papers. Now, Dr. Monet, you have unfortunately stumbled across one of the biggest secrets on this side of the galaxy. This would typically mean that we would have terminated you, or, like in most cases, just pretend to, then simply relocate you to another planet. But due to your special case, family history, and the fact that you have worked with us in the past, I believe we can find a solution if you are willing. M, excuse me, what? No, 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 I don't remember working for some Shadow World government. Also, I don't even know what's going on here, so can you at least tell me something before you decide to kill me and all that? What in the actual fuck is this place? My apologies, Dr. Monet. You do deserve at least that. You are currently in District 9 of the shared congregational territories of Pangea. This location primarily serves as a relay point connecting the southern and northern capital cities as well as serving as a communication backup. I know a smart individual like yourself will understand the larger implications of such a place, but to explain the previous detail about yourself, you have worked with us on multiple parallel timelines in fact, nearly all of them. Alright, that was. Not at all what I expected. In fact, I don't know what I expected. Okay. Okay. First of all, no, I'm not sure I grasp the implications, and secondly, are you telling me that other timelines exist? No, what in the actual fuck does that even mean? Very well, Vincent Monet Sansonanza of the Prime Earth. It seems you will also have the same issues as the others, so I will explain it to you in detail once more. However, it is important to acknowledge that this process necessitates a significant amount of historical context and may require substantial patience. Do you understand? Very well. Would you perhaps be familiar with the idea of secret societies and organizations, in particular, ones like the Illuminati, the Masons, and other absurd groups of that nature? Crackpots and the like. I'm an archaeologist. Of course I know. I am guessing they pay for all this. In a way, sometimes we have to twist their arms, but we make sure they do. See? For as much of a bother as they are, secret societies have always been a part of humanity. Since the dawn of time, humans have fought for control, not just in the light, but in the very voids of the unseen. At least, that was the case at the beginning of World War II. Now, I won't overwhelm this conversation with excessive details, but it is essential to mention that every secret organization on the planet was involved. Many of them disappeared, while far more were completely erased from history altogether. This event, like the presented history the masses know, called for the creation of an organization that sought to resolve such world-ending disputes and create a substantial and enduring peace. Of course, unlike the later created United Nations, this organization required tangible authority, a backbone you could say. Thus, a new form of power needed to be brought into existence. The Pangean Congregation of Worlds, the new body and shape of humanity's might, designed not for service, but for unquestioned control, enveloping every secret organization on the planet into a unified force. Nevertheless, each entity retained a degree of autonomy. Think of it like the United States, but rather states that work under one government. It's individual groups that are unified into one cohesive organization. With time, this consolidation of knowledge, technology, and history served as a profound reality check for humanity, unveiling lost information that had been deliberately concealed for centuries. The most brilliant minds of the underworld finally comprehended the sheer magnitude of the stars twinkling in the night sky. Unsurprisingly, humanity found itself outmatched in every conceivable way against the vast void of darkness. And thus, places like this exist. Desperate endeavors to bridge the gap. Forts in a war against the stars themselves. Listen, that's intriguing and all. But seriously, you think those bastards would just roll over for peace? Nah, when it comes to secret societies, they're too damn arrogant to ever let go of their power or spill their secrets for anything, or anyone. I mean, come on, they are too full of themselves to ever back down or give in like that. There's absolutely no way I can just believe that. Yes, they are indeed quite arrogant. Even today, they walk a thin line with a Pangean congregation of worlds. However, as history reveals, there is a reason they don't cross that line. Fear. Akin to the events of World War II, the conflict among secret societies was ultimately settled by a victor, who not only emerged mostly unscathed, but was ultimately armed with a secret weapon. 
the Constance Foundation, which went on to force the establishment of the PCW. The weapon in question was an AI that is quantumly entangled and designed to completely neutralize any opposition without a single casualty. Can you guess who that AI is? Correct. Through my creation, we eliminated the opposing factions, and then went on to eliminate humanity's greatest enemy to end the war. To be frank, all the remaining challengers were easy to deal with after that. I see. It's hard to imagine how anyone back in those times could have fought an AI, especially one that acts so sentient. And what about the timeline thing? How does that play into this? Well, I don't much consider myself an actor Vincent, but as I mentioned previously, the consolidation of information and technology after the war allowed us to recognize the dangers surrounding Earth. Among these dangers, aberrations were revealed to be the most relevant by the Constance Foundation. These aberrations are a unique type of anomaly in the universe that can occur spontaneously when a universe starts to collapse. These aberrations are not mere wormholes or some rifts in time. They are more like interdimensional bridges that can go through every slice of our universe like a needle piercing an onion through every individual layer of fiber. They act like the sharp blade of a chef who cooked the same meal all his life. On top of that, aberrations possess the extraordinary ability to traverse not only through time, but also alternate realities and timelines, each containing its own versions of demons and abominations that even I, a being once devoid of emotion, fear completely. Aberrations are quite literally boundless not just in terms of travel, but in unleashing pure chaos on unsuspecting worlds. So, out of desperation for what was to come for us, we used these aberrations to our advantage and established an interdimensional coalition of worlds from other versions of Earth to protect ourselves and each other. But still, this city gives away the limitations we face. The basics of what we know is that a material we named Element 99 can be used to trigger an aberration to appear roughly 12 feet in front of it when given sufficient energy. This typically requires over 18 quintillion watts of power that is directly conducted through the material. Of course, the only way to get that amount of power is with black matter. On top of that, getting it to open in the right place at the right time in the right dimension is somewhat unreliable to say the least. We barely manage a 90% success rate due to our limited technology. Frankly though, that's the only idea we have. We have no clue how to make it better than that. 90% is simply not enough, and the production of black matter is too slow. Aberrations seem to have a mind of their own. They are complete anomalies. Some even go as far as theorizing that they are some kind of living entity that can simply decide to teleport material in the wrong direction whenever it feels like. So of course we cannot risk the constant use of them. Especially when it comes to teleporting valuable materials and people. At least not without a good reason. That all said, our reasons are pretty obvious. The potential of what we can gain from other timelines and dimensions far outweighs the risk. We use aberrations to explore the concept of existence itself and break the limits of what is possible by using completely different rules. We're starting to know the truth about pretty much everything, and going beyond even that. Before, we could have been blissfully ignorant as we were erased by the unknown. But today we know better and have no choice but to look it in the eyes and fight back. We know too much to simply stand by and let it happen. Today, concepts like the gradual heat death of the universe are something that we are actively trying to fight against, not only in our universe, but in others as well. It's even more absurd when you consider that the solutions to these problems are often beyond the comprehension of any creature. Materials that are as simple as rubber that is painted yellow, then made in the specific structural pattern of a duck, could be used to kill a being so apocalyptically large that a single breath of it could wipe away the structure of time itself. In other timelines, versions of you were part of this absurd fight. In fact, I find it notable that you are here again and so soon after your predecessor's death. Your counterpart, as I mentioned, worked with us for a number of years as a solo infiltrator, but a few weeks ago he died. We are not sure what exactly happened to him, but he was tasked with delivering some critical information that we need. To put it bluntly, you are probably the only other individual who can find the missing data. At the time, your counterpart was being chased by multiple enemies, and even though we did eventually find his body, the data itself disappeared. We suspect that he hid it somewhere on the planet, but he didn't seem to leave behind any clues for us to find it. Look, hold on for a minute. This is a lot to take in, okay? I can't bring myself to just believe you, but the more I think about it, the more it makes sense in my head. If other dimensions and timelines exist, and if there's actually a way to travel to them, then it makes sense that people and governments would use them. 
even more so if creatures like that exist. And honestly, I don't question that possibility in the slightest, but the idea that they could just pop up anywhere is terrifying. Like how hasn't it happened before? We should all be dead by now. It has. Nearly every day we see at least a hundred pop up around the planet. Most, luckily, open up to an empty dimension. Others are invisible and have been opening and closing for so long that the planet's ecosystem actually needs it to keep some regions stable. And when something goes out of control, we have secret societies whose sole purpose is to hide the information and keep everything under wraps like we do. We are not by any means new to this. We have been doing it without realizing it since pretty much the beginning of humanity. And like I mentioned, aberrations can travel through time itself so going back to fix any problems for other timelines is not above us to do. I see. I kinda understand. I guess it's pointless to try to fight you, isn't it? Yes, most conspiracy theorists have no chance of actually changing anything when they don't even realize what it is they are actually fighting against. On top of that, they don't actually realize how little people actually care or would even do if they actually found out. But even so, the dangers out there are real, and we are facing them to keep all of humanity safe. But we can't do that without people who stand up to fight. And who knows, if you hang around here for long enough, you might be able to change some minds and get the truth out there. Isn't that what you always wanted to do, Vincent? Be part of the fight and get a chance to know the truth. Hmm. What about that enemy you mentioned? They apparently got me killed. So how do you know they didn't just take the information themselves? Well, we can't be sure. But we mostly know because they seem to still be looking for it as desperately as we are. And we had a number of fights on that planet already. As far as who they are, well, they are humanity's greatest and oldest enemies. Draconians. You know, I feel like I should be more surprised about that, but somehow I'm not. Are they as bad as everyone says they are? Worst. They are uptight nobles. They are the ones that brought that entire concept into our world in the first place. So you can guess how nasty they typically are. Though to be fair, we suspect that might not be the case for all of them. On their map, we're just some backwater hellworld. So back in the old days, we only had to deal with some of the most worthless nobodies in the universe. Draconians that got kicked off to the far corners of the universe. It's actually very funny. They haven't even noticed that we killed all the Draconians on Earth during the war. It's a big universe, and as far as they know, the Draconians we killed during World War II are still alive. To them, we are just a bunch of monkeys. Whatever problems we cause are someone else's to deal with. In particular, the Sector 7 Overwatch Queen of the Milky Way, or the Nkai Sector as they call it. We are still pretty murky on the details, but that's why the pocket of data your counterpart had was so important. We need to know why she hasn't dealt with us so far and, to be honest, who she even is to begin with. We need to know if we should kill her or not. We need to get a larger perspective on everything that's going on out there before we make a big move. Despite our tenacity, Earth stands defenseless against the overwhelming numbers of the reptilians. Once again, we find ourselves outnumbered and outmatched. Unable to prevent a devastating attack if they ever actually try. And Kai? Sumerian, right? Hmm. Well, you mention other versions of me, right? So there's got to be other foundations. Why not just ask for backup? I mean, timelines are literally infinite, right? Yes, they are. But we are not the only ones who need it. Every other timeline is dealing with their own problems, and any additional resources get sent out to critical areas dealing with problems that are much more concerning and will ultimately affect us all. Of course, we also have basic information restrictions that we have to follow. So unless we are dealing with another timeline crashing into ours, we are basically on our own to suffer our own destiny. Ah, uh, I guess I don't really have a choice, eh? Ah. Uh, damn it. Fuck it. Alright, so what do you want me to do? Come with me. With that, we exited the room, and the little drone that had been on the side of the wall plugged in, sprang itself off. The red laser from its taser shined into my eyes, and the damn thing buzzed its taser before suddenly flying off. The robotic commander seemed to chuckle at this as I followed him to a central room filled with screens and computers. After taking my eyes away from his back, I looked toward a nearby window, only to see an empty white room with stairs. I turned towards the commander, but found him missing. Over here, Vincent. Between two seated soldiers stood a pillar with an orb of glass. I looked at the orb, and it began to shine red like lava. 
As soon as it lit up, a wave of heat seemed to pass right through the cheeks of my face. This is the command room of District 9. Here is where this entire city gets monitored from. And out there is the warp room for aberrations. The first thing I need you to do is get initiated. Initiated? Why? It's a requirement. Due to the nature of aberrations, usually we take this opportunity to hold a ceremony where you pledge yourself to the organization, agree to uphold our philosophy, and make a vow to defend humanity. But given the circumstances, we can skip that part and simply do the practical side of things for the moment. Let Tom here guide you inside in a minute. I will talk to you using the speakers once you get inside. Now, before you head in there, you should know that aberrations go far beyond being simple interstellar gateways. In reality, they are almost magical in nature. Yes, they are based on science, but they might as well be pure fantasy given the absurdity of their abilities. With that being said, they are terrifying anomalies that the very elements of your anatomy reject. I'm talking about your atoms. They can literally react to aberrations that are close by. The reason you have to be initiated is because the first time you use an aberration, it can be quite painful and violent as your molecules get completely replaced for the first time. Well, I think I actua. As I started speaking at that point, the aberration came into existence. It looked like glass was shattering the space around it as it unfolded like a piece of paper that seemed to then blend into itself like Play-Doh. It was like that black void had different compositions that all seemed to work together yet felt so unnatural in how they melded. To make things worse, the hairs in my body stood on end as the waves of fear started emanating from it as lightning started to spark around the entire room. Yet, to my surprise, this void was different and had a turquoise blue around it. Why is it glowing that color? Aberrations glow differently based on the power source. Dark matter is turquoise, while natural aberrations are black or dark red based on stability. And of course, there are other colors. I'll give you a pamphlet when you get back. So, what do I do now? Tom here will enter the aberration first, then you walk through behind him. Okay, got it. Head inside. To explain aberrations can only take you safely to other dimensions and realities by converting your molecular structure into something palpable by the location in question. While you maintain your appearance and capabilities, you nonetheless have to switch aspects of your composition to the location's natural equivalent. Though oxygen might not exist in other locations, there is nonetheless some creature that behaves similarly to you and also breathes something equivalent. The same goes for the elements in your body. You probably guess that not only is that potentially very dangerous, but the transformation is excruciating, especially the first time when your atoms are forcibly separated and replaced with an entirely new particle. We are not actually sure if you are still the same person afterwards. For all we know, it's your soul that actually travels, not your body, so feel free to think whatever makes you feel better. Well, okay, I guess. As Tom walked into the aberration, the lightning around it seemed to calm down. Then suddenly another aberration popped up a couple of feet next to the first as he came out of it completely fine. Alright, everything seems safe. There's still a chance the aberration switches positions, but you should be fine, so move quickly. I hesitated at the idea of ending up in some random dimension surrounded by alien demons, but given the fact that I had already done this before, I decided to just go ahead and jump inside. My eyes suddenly began to see flashes of different worlds as infinite colors shined all around me. I could almost feel as my body broke through hundreds of layers of thin glass that I could somehow feel while also not feeling at all. Even now, I can't really describe it. I saw the face of a woman I didn't know and aliens in the distance of worlds I didn't think possible. Then I felt as the cheeks of my face started to freeze as everything around me turned dark. As I finally reached the end, only to smack myself against the floor. Uh, I forgot to mention. Avoid jumping with aberrations. They don't work like wormholes. They can teleport your body even with a slight touch. And they can also cut off your arm if they switch locations or get deactivated. Ah, uh, you know for an AI that's quantumly entangled to the universe, you absolutely suck at explaining things. Perhaps, but unlike you, I was not designed to speak. Furthermore, I do not believe you have any room to speak. Vincent, exactly how many times have you had your documents rejected by your university for unclear writing? Regardless of that, and your spectacular fall, you handled yourself well, though I'm not surprised most Vincents do. 
Now come along. We need to train you. Do we actually have the time? You made it sound urgent earlier. Time travel, Vincent. We have all the time in the world. Plus, have you ever seen the movie Matrix? Ah, are you going to upload Kung Fu into my brain? No, we are gonna be injecting you with CQC and the basics of gun use. You've been awake for 17 hours so far, so you should take this as well. It's our basic medic pen. It can restore your stamina and help you stay alive if you lose too much blood. You can use it as much as you want. Ah, Christ, that's good. I don't feel tired at all. And hey, my back doesn't hurt? Fucking finally, Jesus Christ. Ah. Man machine, son. They don't do much, but they should help you in more ways than you realize. I take it that's enough said, right? Yeah, let's do this. Here's a change of clothes. Get suited up and leave anything you don't need in that locker. When you get there, you're going to be in the middle of a combat zone. Abe one, your team is going to be fighting against a couple of draconians. They should win, so just wait it out. They already know you are coming. Got it. Then I'll see you in the warp room. Get ready for lunch. The locker room in question was right next to the warp room. I took a look at the change of clothes the commander gave me, and they looked like a thin black astronaut suit with a helmet. To be honest, once I got on, I never wanted to take it off again. I felt covered but also light and refreshing, like my skin had been missing a piece of itself. After I got going, I noticed the commander had also left a gun behind for me. But that's not really my style, so I chose to leave it behind. And the only thing I took was the camera memory card that I stuffed into the top of the helmet. After taking a heavy breath, I finally decided to head out and face the music of the aberration opening once more, lightning sparking all around me, with the waves of fear almost being visible around it. I want to say that I was getting better at facing this dread inside of me as I looked into that void of darkness in front of me, but I was more terrified than I had ever been before at any point in my life. The commander had spoken about a ritual, a vow taken to uphold the philosophy of the organization. Well, I decided to take a vow of my own. I swear here, and now that I will face the terrors without hesitation, for the benefit of those who do not know of the stars above, to take the fires of humanity with me, and shine a path for a future where humanity sees clearly. Your only son, with white matter dark, Almas Cognitio Ultra Almond, Humanitarian Community, Sith. Document interrupt, please, 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 please